Rose. Hello. 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 Oh, yay, we're awake today. <laughs> My name is Jana. If you've been to a lecture this uh, summer, you've probably met me. I'm the new guest services specialist here at the museum. Now, as a lot of you know, we were historically a mining town, but there's also a huge part of our history that we seldom get to talk about or people even think about, and that largely is due to the homesteading that occurred. And so today we've got Sally Queen from the Summit Historical Society, and she's going to talk to us all about homesteading in Summit County. So let's hear from Miss Sally. <laughs> Yay. Hey, thank you everyone for coming. I mean, on a day like today, let's sit outside and not be interactive on the computer. So if we have some people wandering in, they may have gone to the chapel. So question number one, we're gonna adopt a homesteader. Everybody have a sheet about a homesteader? If you don't, raise your hand. So the Summit Historical Society is a countywide nonprofit that represents the history of all of Summit County. And we adopt a theme each year, and our theme for 2022 is homesteading. Because these are some of the most forgotten names in our history. But first we have to talk about the first users of the land. This is land use. So the first users were our first seasonal rounders, second homeowners. The, the Ute tribes were up around in the, in the valleys in the summertime because they're very, very smart. They don't want to be here and there would be as with 300 inches of snow. We have a great exhibit at the Summit Historical Society at 403 Levante. The address is on the card. Um, it'll be here till September the 6th, and it is on the Ute Nation, developed by History Colorado in conjunction with three of the Ute tribes. We encourage you to come see it. You can take 10 minutes, you can take 10 hours. It is very well done, funded by the National Science Foundation, and we installed it on the 2nd. So please bring yourself and 10 of your favorite friends to come learn about our first land users and understand what it means to be a seasonal rounder and where they went. It also focuses on their science, technology, engineering, and math. This is a program we teach for the fourth graders. I see some of our educators here. Thank you very much for volunteering to do that. We do go into the schools in, during the school year as well as homeschoolers and private schools to teach um, good balanced history of both Summit County and Colorado. So again, it's my pleasure to talk to you about homesteads. I can talk for 30 minutes or 30 hours. Uh, I believe you're here for the 30 minute talk, correct? <laughs> Great. So homesteading in Summit County, who are my people with the Homestead Act papers? All right, y'all gonna have to help me out now. So the Homestead Act was signed into law by President Abraham Lincoln. The first concept actually came from Thomas Jefferson after he was at um, the ambassador to France and about the importance of land and the European land distribution versus what could be possibly be the settling of the West. Well, to Thomas Jefferson, the West was Ohio. Any, anybody from Ohio? That, that part of the world? Right. So by the time Tom, Abraham Lincoln signed it in law, your, the West was west of the Mississippi. So it is a formal act for the distribution of federal lands in the West. What, 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 was, the, what was the age requirement? 21. You had to be 21 years of age. And another requirement, you had to build a house. You had to develop 40 acres. You had to live there for five years. You could not have borne arm, born arms against the union. Did, did we say head of the household? What have I missed? You could be a woman. You could be a woman, and there are women. Do you, anybody have a woman on their homestead sheet? Uh-huh. So you're in Summit County, and this act came in in 1861. But the federal government had to, had to survey the land before then you could apply for your 160 acres. You fulfilled the requirements, you took a witness to the land office and verified that you had fulfilled the obligations and you received a patent. 
No, you didn't do some kind of medicine patent. A patent was the deed to the land. What's the issue today in Summit County? Housing. Housing. So I had physical therapy this morning and I asked the physical therapist, I said, so if you were given requirements to help build workforce housing and live there for five years and be productive in Summit County, would you do it for a free apartment? And she said, heck yeah. yeah. So history isn't always about what happened in the past. There's still a lot of relevancy today when we talk about land use. And the reason that we wanted to do the Homestead Project, Mapping Project, was because so many of these original names are being lost. So who has a sheet of a homesteader and you know that person or you've heard of that person? Okay, who, who do you have? Lansing and Anna Emore had a homestead and she is the founder of the Summit Historical Society. So these uh, sheets have been um, carefully selected perhaps to indicate some place that you live nearby or to help you learn a little bit more. So this physical map, which is what we will take into the schools and actually it'll be on the ground and the kids sit around at third graders, that it is interactive on our website, summithistorical.org and you can go in and just click on any homestead, maybe one near where you're standing. This is using what every kid knows. Have you ever heard of the term GIS? Yeah, no, I hadn't either till, we, till uh, the intern, Will Mertens, gets all the credit for doing this. He used the Bureau of Land Management coordinates for the homesteads, and to our surprise, very few are square. So anybody from Kansas or Iowa or Missouri, places where you would have seen a homestead would have been 40, 40 acres by 40 acres by 40 acres to equal 160 acres. Do you see that on this map? No. What you can see is the southernmost homestead, and we're going to go through your sheets in chronological order in a minute, but what you're not seeing homesteads are down here on the bottom or over here on the east. How come? Mountains. 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 Good guess. There's more to it. Yeah, the use of the land was for mining. So, again, homesteaders are building a house. Imagine in 1859 when gold is discovered in Breckenridge, the use of the land down here is not available now because it's been claimed by mining. Over here, 1860, silver, Montezuma. Tens of thousands of miners are flowing in over the mountains. So we affectionately say about Benjamin Franklin Rice that he came for the gold, but he stayed for the land. So you're seeing it not only for the mountains, but also for the mining claims. So this is available federal land. Everybody got it? You only have to leave with three things and there will be a test later. <laughs> if you're holding a homesteader, you got it. Okay. Any questions about the use of the land on the southern part of the county? Great. So again, if you go to our website, which we hope you will, you can click here and say, well, ah, what's going on out there? You can click here and get a name. So let's start talking about some of the 305 homesteaders. I told you, 30 hours or 30 minutes. We're not going to cover but 10 of them. So over the course of this project, and we do have to say thank you, not have to, but we are gratefully say thank you to the Summit Foundation who funded this part of the project and have funded the second phase, which is to do the story maps on 12, only 12 of those uh, families. I, I think it's called job security, but I'm, I'm not sure about that. So let's start with the, the very first homestead was by Jesse Millsap. Now we don't have any records more than that was his first homestead. So we're going to start with the ones that we have of those. So Jesse Millsap's homestead was in 1883. When again was the Homestead Act signed into law? 1861 by which president? Very good. Very good. Uh, we are looking for a few more teachers if you're interested. Okay. So who's got Benjamin Franklin Rice? 
Oh, a lot of you do. Anybody know Alan Rice, his grandson? Have you listened to any of his talks? Yeah, we do have a couple of them on our website in, under our online programs. Alan turned 85 last week, and he's a source of an awful lot of great stories. And if I'm, if I'm lost on something, I call him. So I did talk to him yesterday, and his grandfather, Benjamin Franklin Rice, came from Kansas, a, a dirt farmer. He came to Leadville first. He heard about the gold in Breckenridge. He came here first with a Pharaoh dealer. He was going to gamble his way to fortune. He tried a little panning of gold, but he was staying up in Chihuahua, which is one of our ghost towns in Summit County, and we have a great online talk done by Christy Nelson, Wave Christy, um, on the lost towns of Summit County, and one of them includes Chihuahua. He falls in love with Mabel, whose parents have a a boarding house and hotel in Chihuahua. So he stays up in that part of the county. So let's see if I can do this. So when you click on these, it'll show you where the Benjamin Franklin Rice, he does sign, he's a county commissioner eventually, and he does sign his scripts with Ben, even though I called him BF for years. Um, he marries Mabel. They have one child when he applies for his, um, when he gets his patent. So who's got the date of his patent? 18, 1898. So when you see the date of his patent, now what do you have to do? You have to do a little math. He's lived there for five years. He's built a house. He was head of household. So already by fulfilling the obligations, you learn the basics about him. So he moves and he builds a house, and that area now is called Summit Cove. One of the first subdivisions, um, the Rice family sold it in the late 50s to a developer, and they built Summit Cove. So as the first homesteader, over time, according to Allen, they, they purchased the Phillips, the Squires, and all the land around them. That's the second 30 hours of homesteading. So basically, once you have your patent, you got to subtract that day. you got to subtract five off of it, and that's when you first applied. So once you've got that land, what are you going to do? You've built the house. He has more children. As soon as Benjamin Franklin Rice <coughs> completes his patent, he builds a barn as well. He moves into Dillon, and he uses the land to grow hay. Now, on there, you also see that he had, uh, what, five or six different uh, revenue sources. He becomes a county commissioner. He is paid. He also owns a saloon in Dillon. He has a hauling company that he is using to pick up goods in Dillon, go up to the 1919 Rice Barn, and if you by chance have already purchased your $5 history hunt booklet, which Morgan has over there. Um, the rice barn is on there, and um, he used that for the draft horses. That barn held 18 horses. He's then taking goods, people, mail, up to his store in Montezuma. So let's see. He's hauling ore back. He owns a saloon. He's a county commissioner, <laughs> and he's growing hay. Anybody here have five jobs living in Summit County? Okay, the next time you get this from, oh, I got two jobs, you tell them about Benjamin Franklin Rice. They eventually do have eight children, and that um, it, the, the developer then deeded the barn, the 1919 barn, to the Summit Historical Society, and it is maintained for special events as well as interpretation to show you what life was like. It's not it, it's not winterized, and the raccoon really loves the second floor. But the Rice family would put up to 30 to 50 tons of hay on the second floor. And Alan tells us that that was the messiest job on the ranch. Eventually, his father Earl inherits the land and begins buying up. Um, the land around it. So what we've lost then is the story of the Squires and the Phillips and the people that did the initial settling. So hopefully that's the theme we want you to know over and over again is where did the story get lost? Because you may be hearing the name of the second. Anybody live at Ruby's Ranch? 
No Ruby Ranch. Ruby was the second homeowner. Ruby Lowe and her husband were the second homeowners. Oftentimes moving into that house that they built initially. Okay, so Benjamin Franklin Rice, wife, Mabel, and eight children, of which we are, we do have some excellent pictures from Alan of life on the ranch. So, next one. Riley. Riley. Edda and Ed Riley. So, they have a homestead that the land is still preserved. It is right here. If you come off Swan Mountain Road, it's right in front of you. He at one time owns the Mint. But he also, the way I learned his name is he sponsored the baseball team in 1905. And the uniform that we have says Riley's Dillon. I said, who's that? Went looking, and actually on August 22nd, the family is bringing us boxes of pictures from Ed and Etta Riley um, when they saw the information in the newspaper. That was our ultimate goal, was to connect them with families who could tell us more <laughs> stories. Um, and th there are some great pictures, but he also has uh, multiple revenue sources. And according to Mike Clary, who researched much of the Snake River, um, that land was put into open trails land. So it will stay undeveloped. Everybody gonna look now when you get to the stoplight at Swan Mountain? Okay. Right in front of you. And, and according to the family then, they, had, they dug canals off of the snake at that point too have water. So you should notice all the way going up, it's all about water, which was our theme for 2021. Right? Okay. And what year did he get his patent? 1898. Who's got the next one in line? I won't even check my sheets. Y'all got to help me out. What do you got? Everybody knows it by Bill's Ranch. But what if you called it Bill's Ranch when you went to look up? You wouldn't find it. Because why? It's a Thomas Ranch. It was a woman. It was his mother. Yep. So give me, give me a little, few more information on there since you've got the microphone. Okay. She had a dairy farm and um, neighborhood space to sustain the Frisco community. And today the ranch house is now located in the Frisco Historic Park and continues to be a Frisco neighborhood. Yep. And Rose and her team at Frisco Museum, we can't thank them enough. She'll be writing the story mapping online for us about their story, both mom, and then it is Bill that turned it into one acre houses. And so his model was completely different of how to use the land. It's still use of the land at that time. So we're talking 1910. Did we miss anybody in there? So it goes from 1898 to 1910. Tremblay? Oh yeah. we. <laughs> Okay, I'll go off script and tell you about Paul and Emma Tremblay, only briefly, because nobody has a sheet on them. Emma Tremblay we found through, my husband Bruce is a great researcher and he finds a, one of our affidavits and it's for the trial of Emma Tremblay. We go into the newspapers. The uh, manager of the Green Mountain, the Green Canal Company comes onto their homestead because he says they have the right to the water and he's going to remove her headwaters. She says, no, you're not. Paul's not there at the time. He is a county commissioner. He's not there. She goes inside, gets her gun. He wrestles her to the ground and files charges, attempted murder. She's put on trial. Um, women don't have the vote. It's all men. It's all ranchers pretty much at that point and these homesteaders. And it's a hung jury. What? It's a hung jury. <laughs> They try her again. It's a hung jury the second time. And there was a motion to uh, apply to another county for the trial. We don't know the answer, but we're pretty sure it's a one-act play called Emma Get Your Gun. <laughs> Off script. Who's got, the, who's got um, the next date on your papers? Kenor. You've got Kenor? No, I don't. Who's got Kenor? Sometimes called Knorr. We're not. We'll have to ask. Bobby Knorr is still active in the county up with um, up at the Elks Lodge. So they're way up top. So tell me about them. Well, they had two patents, one in 1913 and one in 1921. They owned and ranched the land until 2017. Up in the north, on the blue, the lower blue. 
still active family in town. And you can search Library of Congress. They have donated their photos to the Library of Congress. Go to the LOC. Dot gov and you've got great pictures of some of their cattle and their information and still an active family in town so you see eight years difference I don't know the story yet but there is a story did they need more land and you can see down here the on the um, on the legend that there were different acts that were passed that enabled people to add land like the arid desert act and you go okay how'd they get water really all goes back to water. How did they use that land? So as you can tell, we're not, in case you came for a finished book, it, it's not done yet. We're not done yet. Who's next after the Canors? Delker. Who's got Delkers? Oh, Bailiff. Who's Bailiff? Yeah, okay. So tell us a little bit about Emma Benson Bailiff. Homestead Patent, 1914, acres 161. Second job, a hay farmer, produced milk, cream, and butter. And the use today is under Lake, under, under Lake Dillon. So thank you, Jean Adams, who has done research for the Swedish Genealogical Society on Emma Benson. She came here as a Swedish immigrant to clean the hotel rooms at the Denver Hotel. She is one of the few that are underwater. So as we were working on this project, we had a really great phone call from a granddaughter, and she said, yeah, but my family's homestead's underwater, so I don't need to come to Summit County anymore. Matt took the call, he clicked on the map, and he sent her back a picture. He said, this will be live in about two months, but no, your family's homestead's not underwater. And she says, great, I'll come back and see it. We knew we were on the right track at that point. So Emma Benson Bailiff is married to Tiff Bailiff, who was from Switzerland, and it is their daughter, Anna E. Moore, who also has a homestead that founded the Summit Historical Society. Tiff at that time is living with Anna and Lansing. There's more to this story in there, Jean. Yeah, I'll see you next year, right here. All right, who do we have after Emma Benson Bailey? But she's a woman, she's fulfilling the contract. She actually paid cash, $1.25 an acre, which was the established amount. There's a story here. Okay, who's got next? Who else do we have? Barney, Barney Watley comes here um, and gets his first patent in 1916. They're the southernmost down here, right here. He invites his parents to come. We've just found this information out in the last two weeks. So his mother filed for a patent and the father filed for a patent. What else do you have on the Watleys? The patent was 1916. It's 487 acres. And his second job was district attorney. So Barney was the district attorney. There's a story here, too. He shot his dad. Dead. He was tried and acquitted because they said the man was mean. You can find these stories out in historic, Colorado historical newspapers. I'm not making this up. But the Watley is one of the few that are still in private hands and protected into that original 50 acres. Uh, the Summit Historical Society generally members only do take tours up there. So we'd encourage you to join. We're a member only organization, not supported by any kind of government. So it's our members and our donors that, that drive what we do. But it's one of the southernmost and it's now called the Red Tail Ranch. Uh, private owned. Don't don't drive up there, but it is now called the Red Tail Ranch. Okay, who has after the Watleys? Sondreggers. Who's got Sondreggers? Christy, go. The patent was in 1918, 132 acres, and we think he was a full-time rancher. So John Sondreger, we had to put it in because there's just this great hay picture. But according to Alan Rice, as of two days ago, the Sondreggers, somebody point me out, Sondreggers have got to be right in here. Right there. So the Sondreggers originally homesteaded that for the timber, according to Alan. And then within a very short time, they bought the homestead from the last name is Boshi, B-O-U-S-C-H. Again, I'll see you next year with more story on the Bashis, and that's actually where the picture is from, from Alan Rice's collection. That's of the Bashi land, and that's where they grew the hay. 
but their original homestead was for a different use than, than ranching. It was for the timber. And we do have quite a few pictures of the Sondreggers, and it, it, it's a great story. It'll be one in our story maps. Okay, who's got one more? Who have we got left? Delker. Delker. <laughs> who's got Delker? You got Delker, Susan? No, who's got Delker? Delker, okay. What, what do we have on the Delkers? His patent was in April 1919, 164 acres. His second job was working with various mining companies. Awful lot in the historical newspapers on Charles Delker. He was also here with his brother Thomas. The reason that you have those, and you can pick up some of the other sheets that we have left um, when you can adopt your homesteader, um, is that their homestead cabin is behind the 1883 Dillon Schoolhouse uh, in Dillon at 403 Labonte, and you can go in and see how they lived, the size of the house. Lula and Dent Myers lived there. Lula lived there until the 1960s with no running water and everything that's implied with that. Um, <laughs> it was moved there um, in when they developed Keystone, and the Delkers' land is right here. Is that the Delkers? Yeah. 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 Right at the base of School Marm Run. You'll see a great exhibit inside on Lula Myers. Uh, Lula Osborne Myers, she was the school marm at the school in Frisco. So you're seeing this history, you're just not recognizing it to the connection to the past. Who have we got? We got any others? Who do you have? Emor. Emor. All right, tell us, Susan. Uh, patent, um, April of 1921, 165 acres. She was uh, appointed the first museum director in Summit County and uh, she was the founder of the Summit Historical Society, followed shortly by Susie. Yep. So there is an overview of a few, just a few, of the homesteaders of Summit County. If you thought you were going to get all 305 names, well, go to the interactive map, click on it. Again, this is all public information from the Bureau of Land Management. It'll also show you their patent. It'll, it'll show you those kind of hidden names oftentimes that we um, have not heard about. Or if you hear of one, then go research it. We do have um, many primary documents, both photos and affidavits and letters. Letters say from the Lindstroms, the Lindstrom Cattle Ranch and Cattle Company were operating during World War II and sending beef to um, the World War II, people fighting the World War II. So there, there are great Summit County stories in these and we hope you'll take time to explore it. And I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Yes, ma'am. What else did they use the land for? Um, the timber came, came out of there. And, and Christy and the Historical Society do this great talk for the realtors in Summit County. And we talk about the gold in Breckenridge and the silver in Montezuma. This period we termed both brown and green for both the timber as well as for the ranching. Then you've got the blue gold of Lake Dillon and you've got the white gold of the ski resorts. So the other use for the land, maybe Bill's Ranch might be a good example of other um, dairy cows and, and food that was needed. According to Alan, he at five years old had to do the weeding of the family garden and he said he got a nickel a row. And we said, well, how long was the row? He said, 20 yards. And so um, pretty much most people have heard about Keystone had a commercial lettuce farm. So it's primarily being used, though, the land um, for cattle. No, we're not riding horses for entertainment at that point. Um, it, it's pretty much for, if it's got cattle, it's called a ranch. Chicken. Chickens, absolutely. Chicken, the eggs, food, mm -hmm. food category. Anybody else know of a use besides? I mean, in talking to Alan and the Sondreggers using it for timber, that was a, a different use to me than the, than the traditional that we thought of. Moonshine, uh, Bruce's favorite topic to research, but it's not going to be the theme next year, is moonshine. Um, there are some great stories. <laughs> yes, sir. That's, that's a great question. How did you know where your boundaries were? It was surveyed by the federal government, and in that survey, then it was marked. They had markers, 
and that the land office, and you, you hear people going to the land office in Denver, uh, they're going to the land office in Leadville. There's not a land office in Summit County that I can find at this point, but um, that, that's stone Museum stone World for, I don't know. Is there a post in the corner or something? Yeah, like post that? in the corners. So it's measured, and what, what most people say who have seen this, that no homesteads from other states is they're not square. And it, it's really basically driven by the mountains, by the mining, by the land. But the federal government sent the surveyors, and they did the surveyors, and then you selected. Do, I, do we have a diary that says from the sun draggers that say, I selected this land because it had the best timber? No, but if you know of any of those, please give me a call. We'd love to see that in first person written. Yes, ma'am. Going to the Wheeler Ranch, it was not cattle, but sheep. Sheep. Thank you, Christy, that's right. The Wheelers up near Copper had sheep. So again, there are many, 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 many stories here um, for many generations beyond us to un unravel. This is just the base. If you have the base, send us an intern with a place to stay. Um, <laughs> yes, ma'am. So way more means that they that they're, they're like the Watleys, there were three people that applied at that point. And if you think back about what's happening in 1920 in the U.S., um, again, these are the discoveries that you'd love it if a diary showed up and it says, hey, they loosened the laws. Uh, there, and I looked, listened to it yesterday. There is a great talk by John, who's the historian at the Homestead Museum, which is a National Park Service in Nebraska. And he was explaining about how laws changed that enabled people to get more land. And I got lost in every law that seemed to change. But just so much is changing in the U.S. in terms of people and in terms of economics that um, I, I suspect that one of those, say, from 1919, 1920, of where there's more than 160 acres, is that's tied up in it. We're, we're looking for volunteers, by the way, if anybody wants to research. And, and, you know, you bring up a really good point, Christy. At least we'll now all understand the word homesteading and, and what it meant to the distribution of land, not just in Colorado, not just in Summit County, but throughout the West. And that's dictated by federal by federal laws. And that land, there may have been no one else applying. There's years worth of research here <laughs> that hopefully you'll, you'll get a feel for that, um, that there's many more things. But click on the map, and the Guybersons would be a good one to do that with and see who it was, if there's different names, that it was, you know, one family like the Watleys, where it was a mother, father. Again, lots of people stories, lots of land use, and hopefully if, if you have adopted your homesteader, you'll take that opportunity to look in more about them and learn more about them and look, you know, go, go look online and just click. Next big snowstorm, just go click. See what some of the names are. These are names we did not want to lose in Summit County who are really now part of this resort community where they're building Smith's Ranch our Maryland Creek Ranch. And again, you'll get two homesteads, pardon the plug, but we do make our money also on the sale of products. Five dollars, you can do this in about 15 hours and get your prize at the end of, uh, of, of that. And there are two homesteads in here that you can learn about and learn more about the use of the land. So thank you very much for being a great audience. <laughs>